what we have up now is um, Steve. Now, Steve has decades of experience uh, in consultancy and advisory work around enterprise software integration and information management in government and industry. Um, he specializes in service design implementation and has been trusted to deliver on a number of UK uh, critical government projects in defense and the national security sectors. Uh, so Steve is part of the National Digital Twin Program delivering what's known as the big box of boring. So you're gonna have to uh, bear with me very briefly as I flip over to that. Brilliant. Um, nice to meet you, everybody. Apologies, I couldn't be there in person. Um, I think um, you probably um, can see the screen okay now. So, yeah, thanks very much for the intro, Ian. Uh, yeah, a bit of background. My background is primarily in um, the delivery of complex projects, primarily in the, in the last 10, 15 years in the defence and national security space. But before that, I um, did an awful lot of work with BIM, uh, working on a large nuclear site, bringing in uh, large capital projects and integrating their integration across um, with the existing campus information. So I think probably uh, looking at some of the attendees in the room, I think you probably share some of the same scars. But it's lovely to be with you today. So today I'm going to give you a bit of a run through on the work we're doing with um, the National Digital Twin. Uh, I want to give you a bit of an introduction to the company and what we're doing first, uh, but I'll keep that as brief as I possibly can before we can get onto the inter interesting stuff. And then we'll give you a demo as well. So hopefully I can slickly switch between uh, PowerPoint and uh, Internet Explorer as we move on. Okay, yeah, so today, the big box of boring. So um, we'll get into what that is in a second, but just to give you a quick introduction into who we are as a company, uh, you've just met Ian, who's my co-founder, who is our CTO. I'm the COO, I look after operations and our customers. Um, so our mission really is to create technologies that accelerate digital innovation. Um, we are a startup. I'm not sure how long you're allowed to call yourself that for, but we, start, we started the tech and development in 2018. We founded the company in 2020. Uh, we're based in London. Uh, we, we were effectively COVID babies. So we, we, we started as a remote firm, but we do have an office in London now. Uh, 20 of us, um, uh, we're a really a fantastic team of, of staff that we have um, uh, working on our product and we're growing rapidly. Customers in private and public. This is a bit cheeky, but we always leave with this. We are engineers and implementers first and foremost. So if you're expecting slick PowerPoint, as you can already see, this is not our forte, but we, we leave with our engineering. We're all about, can, you know, we'll be very honest about what we can do, what we can't do. Um, and we want to sort of grow that relationship with people that we're working with. Uh, and we're a revenue based, so we haven't taken um, investment. We are owned and operated by the founders and our staff. So we're, um, we're, we're, we're about sort of trying to build that sustainable, ethical company as we move forward. So what do we do? So Ian and I uh, and another gentleman called Tom, we're all working in, in large enterprise environments. And we realized that they were really, really struggling to innovate, struggling to kind of move forward and do the things they wanted to do. Um, and in a lot of cases, you know, there's people will tell you it's, it's, it's about the culture, things are, you know, it's difficult to change and change is difficult to achieve. However, we found that in most environments we worked in, the culture part was fine. You know, there's, there's, there, you often get the odd stick in the mud, it doesn't want to change, but, but by and large, the culture in those environments are fine. The fact of the matter is, it's just really, really difficult to do. Innovation can happen in a vacuum, so you can work on a project and, you know, you do something really cool in a, in, over a few sprints or a, a couple of months, start presenting that business, everyone goes, that's really great, I'd love that. And then, so let's put it into production, and that's when everything slows down. And when we looked into that, we identified there were a number of reasons, and primarily because those fast moving innovators don't necessarily consider all the stuff that is necessary to bring something into production. So security, monitoring, compliance, audit, RRD, all those things which you need for it to assure a product or assure an outcome at enterprise, but you don't necessarily think about during that innovation stage. So our idea was, could we build um, a platform or a tool set um, that takes care of all that boring stuff and allows it rapid moving innovators to do what they do and gives the enterprise the assurance they need to move things forward. So that's how Core was born. Core is a product that's designed to do that. It effectively works as a data integration and innovation platform that allows you to take data from your client systems or from data feeds, bring it into the core, run it through a process, which I'll go through in a second, and then present it out via highly secure APIs that you can build cool stuff on top of. It's designed as open source, and we'll get into why we've open sourced it in a little bit, but it's designed to give the power back to the organizations that own the data. We want people to be building cool stuff on top. You're not, you, know, you shouldn't be beholden to any particular supplier to do so. Um, just as a quick idea of what's happening in Sidecore, 
Um, you can take data through an adapter, clean it, resolve it, map it. Uh, Ian's just given you a great run through of IES. So in the cases you're going to see today, we can map it to IES. It then projects it into some smart caches, which are effectively secured databases. Now we've taken security as a really our prime consideration with design of this platform. So we use an ABAC security method. That's an attribute based access control security method uh, that was developed by GCHQ and the NSA. Um, which basically means that every single participle of data, be it a cell in a table, be it a, 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 a node or a line on a graph, has its own security and data headers. And it only gets out of that API, you can see on the right hand side, if the user's attributes match that data. So what that means is that people can build stuff on the APIs knowing that the um, data platform is taking care of the cleansing of the, the, the mapping of the data, the resolving of the data, the audit, the provenance, all those things you can see across the bottom there, the authorization, the platform kind of takes care of that. We're building the platform out to be zero trust. We're not there yet. It's something we're working on. And we're also building in a federation capability, which I'll talk about in a, in a, in a, in a second. Um, the two key security elements in the platform are attribute ABAC and zero trust. So take anything away today if you want to read. And you've got Ian in the room there, so I encourage you to harangue him at any opportunity about access and zero trust with ABAC and zero trust. But they are the sort of key elements of the security part of the platform. So hopefully that gives you a little idea of what we're, what we're doing, what we're building. I've, I've really now want to move on to the NDT. So as, as I said, we sort of founded in 2020. We've, or we've, we've been working largely primarily within the defense and national security space, but we got, I had a chance, an opportunity to present to the NDT team about what we were doing. And that led to a really an agreement that we would open source the entirety of core as a platform and make it available to uh, the NDT program to use in return for some co-development funding. So what we've been working on over the last sort of 18 months or sort of 14, sorry, 14 months with the, with the NDT is really getting to a point where we can create the integration architecture necessary to build up those digital twins. Now, a real spoiler alert right up front, I'm not going to show you a digital twin as part of the demo, but I am going to show you what the effects of bringing loads of disparate data sets together can be. Um, but to give you an insight into some of the challenges you face in the digital twin world, and I think anybody that's worked with data in any environment will recognize some of these challenges, be it around digital twins or not. This digital twins are a fantastic opportunity um, for us to realize some, um, uh, to adopt some new challenges and opportunities, but there are some real things to consider when you're bringing data together, especially if you want to make that repeatable. So you've got to start thinking about standards. Now Ian's just walked us through, through IES as a way of standardizing around data, but things around, you know, like I say, security standards, um, compliance standards, compliance and all that sort of stuff all need to be agreed. We need to agree how we're going to map and convert incoming and outcoming data from, from, from the system. We need to look at the interfaces necessary to bring data in and out of that system. It obviously needs to be secure, so people need to trust the system. And we need to ensure that the integration architecture for National Digital Twin has, has, has got a sense of scale. So what dropped out of that was really a set of um, a design principles that we're working on as part of the design of, of applying core to the National Digital Twin. So I'll quickly whiz around them, but I think they should be pretty um, open and obvious. Top one is obviously security. People need to trust the data they, they put in is going to be looked after and only seen by those that are able to see it. And they need to trust that the system itself isn't going to open them up to any sort of systematic vulnerabilities or issues. Um, it needs to be open and flexible. Uh, again, I said earlier in my previous life, I was the um, asset uh, systems architect for a very large nuclear site. My job was bringing in all the data from large uh, build projects into a campus environment, make, merging that data with maintenance management, building management systems, asset management systems, finance systems. And what you had there was the sort of, you know, you, you had proprietary format wars. What we need to avoid here is, 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 is that. We need to keep it as open and as flexible as possible. So again, open standards wherever we can. Um, it needs to have low technical barriers. This is something that's really, really come, come home with the work we've been doing with the NDT. You, you do kind of get used to, in some cases, working with the military and working with the national security community a degree of technical capability and resource availability that just isn't available to some other customers, the National Digital Twin. So we need to keep the barriers to adoption to the NDT as low as is humanly possible. It obviously needs to be robust and performant. It needs to be, you know, uh, people need to trust that it will be available and, and, and useful in the use. It needs to be compliant. People need to trust that the data they're putting through it, any compliance arrangements they have around those data will be honored as they go through it. These last two are bolded and underlined because they're really quite important in terms of making a business case for the NDT. As far as we can see it, the integration architecture needs, needs to form part of the overriding business case for why somebody should join the National Digital Twin. 
So it needs to be low friction. You know, if, if I come into an, in your environment, and I can just imagine with my previous hat on, if someone said to me, hey, come and join the National Digital Twin, it's really great. All you need to do is change absolutely everything you do. Um, it's going to be a really, really hard to case, a case to take, and I'm probably not going to take that up to my board for a decision. And the flip side of that is I also need to say, okay, I'm going to make it easy for you to join, but I need to be able to demonstrate value. And we'll get onto in a little bit how we would demonstrate value in a second. But the whole idea is the integration architecture should add something to the capability of the, of the subscribing department. They should be able to build some, uh, some stuff. They should be able to see some value just from having the integration architecture in their environment, not just um, effectively public good or, um, or, or undefined benefit that may well come in the future. They should be able to describe the benefits that are coming from them. So these are all the sort of design principles we've used when we're looking at how we've integrated core into the national digital twin integration architecture. Um, in terms of how we're looking at how it works, so this, uh, the idea is effectively what you've got is a federated ecosystem where each NDT stakeholder will take a, take a core, they will bring that in, and they'll connect it up to their client systems, bring in their data feeds, bring their data in, it will bring that data through the process we showed before, which effectively gets it ready. So you've got IES, cleanse, resolve, ma uh, uh, mapped IES data available in smart caches for use uh, internally initially. We talked about value a second ago. The whole idea here is you do not share a thing. You don't share anything with the outside world until you are completely comfortable. You understand exactly what you're sharing, the quality of it, the ramifications of sharing it, and you can describe it appropriately. But what people can do internally is they can use those smart caches to A, to test that data, to test the functionality they need to build, but also they can build their own apps on tap. The APIs are open, so they can start building applications with their own data internally on top of their own core without presenting it to the outside world. Uh, and, you know, in, in a lot of cases, we're getting really good traction with that in, in certain business environments, because this means they can start to get rid of legacy capability. So they're bringing out all their nice uh, brownfield data into effectively a greenfield site, and they can build new applications on top. Or they can really, really start to run compliance and audit over the data to see exactly what they might be potentially sharing with, with others. Only once they're completely happy that the data they, in, they intend to share is, is meeting their, their internal policy, they effectively press the button through the federation component, which is a component that's been built specifically for the MOD and for the National Digital Twin to share it with other stakeholders. So how does it work? Um, it's very much a pub sub type environment. So it's a federated ecosystem. It's not a hub and it's not, we're not building one giant digital twin to rule them all. The whole idea is that you'll be able to uh, subscribe to the National Digital Twin and then you can work with other stakeholders to share information. Now, a lot of stuff still needs to be built. So there's a, a, there's a whole data cataloging functionality, which we, which we don't have at the moment, but will be built on, you know, into an endpoint so that you as a, a, an entity or a body can understand what data you, you wish to share with others and other people can come and have a look at it, inspect the data that you have available. We've got to do all sorts of things on the policy side, like, you know, is it open sharing? Uh, do we have sharing that is contractual based? So it says actually, yes, I'll publish that I'm willing to share it, but we need to enter into a contract that you can share it. But the whole idea is that the data is available to share with others. And in the end, what you can do is because you can assemble the data that you need to build a twin that's relevant to your job. You know, there's no point in me saying, actually, once you're connected, we're just going to build a giant digital twin to rule them all in the middle. So if I'm doing a study on soil erosion in the north of Scotland, I don't necessarily need the weather data for the Silly Isles. I can actually choose the data that I need for part of the digital twin. Um, the other thing we're going to build, we don't have this at the moment, this is vaporware, but we're starting on the design and starting to understand what this might take is a sort of management node. So the management node would look after um, the subscribers to the ecosystem and understand who's there, probably do some work around master and reference data management and look at how we register and, and control who can access the data. That doesn't exist at the moment. That's a piece of work we'll probably be doing next year. But the whole idea is that, again, this federated ecosystem is controlled and we understand who's taking part and we can apply and control data standards and understand that that is necessary from this central core. So we talked earlier about barriers to adoption. Uh, again, having been through some of these things in the past and, 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 and seen how painful it can be, we're going to try and keep this relatively simple. This is a, um, this is a prototype journey. We haven't tested this yet. This is where we uh, kind of area we'd like to be. So. A user can decide to take part in the National Digital Twin. I'm, now I know Alex, like who, who you met earlier, is looking at some of the policy framework, for how people join, when they join, what sort of um, qualifying criteria they may be. But from a technical perspective, they'd uh, join the National Digital Twin, they'd install their core on premise or in the cloud. And as part of that install, we'll register that with the NDT management node. 
Um, they connect, the, they choose the data they want to share. This is massively important. They choose their data journey through the system. You know, we, we cannot be prescriptive. Previous iterations of this, of this project became very prescriptive about what data was going to be shared, when, how, and so on and so forth. And again, what we saw was a lot of organizations just almost refusing the defense and saying, we can't do that. So at the end of the day, the users that's coming on board, they choose the data that they share. They adapt it into the system using the adapters. We have a, a toolkit in um, core called Maplib, which basically allows people to very quickly um, connect data in. They then map it to the NDT data standard, which is the IES Ian, Ian just run through with you. And they then specify the ABAC labels, uh, security labels for the data they're sharing. So they effectively, they describe how they want to secure that data. Now at that point, it will start streaming into their core environment. It's really important to understand that they haven't shared that with anybody yet. They're still inside their operational boundary. So as I said, they can start looking at that data through their own core system, building applications on top of it to test out new functionality, or just do compliance and audit checks on that data before it goes. And when, and only when they're happy, they can then decide, okay, I'm now happy to publish that data to the NDT and share it. So we want to keep this journey relatively simple and really importantly, the, the data owner needs to be in absolute and total control of what they share in the outside world. So um, that's quite enough PowerPoint. Let's see if we can actually give you a demo of, of something that's happening. So what I'm going to show you how now is a, is a, uh, a, a demo scenario, I'll, I'll stress again, it is a digital twin, you're not going to see live feedback, I'm not going to change the points on a, on a railway station or anything like that. Um, what we're going to do is show you the power of bringing loads of disparate data sources together. Now, um, we've got, I think, four or five different data sources coming in, we've got some databases, uh, we've got some survey work that ENM did on the Isle of Wight, we've got some open source scraping, we've got a various, we've got some fake NHS data, because we're not putting real people data in this at the moment. And we've got some feeds from the environment agents as well, all coming through the core platform, all being cleansed, adapt, or adapted, cleansed, resolved, and mapped into IES and then promoted through these smart caches. I am going to show you very quickly a couple of proprietary apps just for, um, uh, so the platform itself is open source, but obviously as a, as a company, we've got to make some money somewhere. So we'll be transparent about how we do that. We have a couple of applications that sit on top of our platform. You are under no obligation whatsoever to use them. In fact, you could build your own if you wanted to. These just give you a head start. So very, very quickly, we talked about ABAC earlier. So basically what that means is that every user connected to the system has a set of attributes that uses to describe them. And those attributes are what are passed to the APIs to work out exactly what data they can see. So we can see in this system at the moment, I'm in the system as an American national. I work for a utility company um, and I don't have, I have a low security classification. These are using um, the ICIHM labels currently. We're doing a piece of work this year to allow us to have far more labels to describe people but they're usually using a set of labels that are used by the, the national security community. So if I now go into search, uh, this is a search uh, engine that we've built on top of, of, of the core platform, and we're going to search for cows. we see in here, I get uh, an Egypt point component combined sewer route. We can start to see some of the power of the IES ontology that Ian was describing just a second ago. So we can see that it's typed. So we know that this combined server is a type of facility. We can see it's got an identifier, WLO17, and we can see it's got a, a common name, the Egypt Point CSO. But we can also start to see that the power of that in graph. So if I come into graph here, I can start to see my connected data. So if I add some data in, it's not giving me much really. It's, it's letting me know the position of that object. Um, but, and it's letting me know that a, what an assessment has been done that object, but it's not letting me see anything else. Well, I've had the misfortune of being down as combined sewer out for a few times. And I know that in the end of the day, they're usually pumped, um, but I can't see any evidence of any connection to a pump or an electrical system in there. Well, that's because in our, our application here, we've said that all electrical data is labeled with uh, UK only. So I need to be a UK citizen to see that data. So if I very quickly come in here and I change my passport to the United Kingdom and update that, and then come back into search, sorry, into graph, right, and click again. I can now add two more things that weren't there before. That's because my, my attributes are being recompared, recompared at the API level, and I'm now allowed to see the electrical data that the electrical company has provided into the system. So I can now see that the CSO is connected to that, to that substation. So again, a really, really simple demonstration of IES, really. So the two, the two key elements of the platform, which is the unification of all that disparate data into an IES format, into a knowledge graph there, and then security of that data actually in operation. Um, let's move away now into the application that we've actually built for the National Digital Twin. So this is Paralog, um, not a digital twin. I'm going to say that again, uh, just, to, just to ram it home. 
Uh, but fundamentally, what's happening here is I have loads and loads of that data all been brought through. And this is just another viewpoint on it. I could view it in search, I could view it in graph, I could view it in parallel gear, or I could view it in another application that is yet to be built. We're actually doing some really cool work with a company called Augment City, who are taking the data off of Core and doing something really cool with 3D. They're building their own app on top of the platform, uh, which will be available to view soon. So let's just bring on some bits here. So I can start to understand asset independency on the island. Um, we have to thank e &M for this. Uh, e &M did the painful work of, I think, doing all this from open source, Ian? Yep. Uh, but we can start to see some of the asset independency on the island. So if I, you know, very, very quickly using this, this graph here on the left-hand side, I can start to understand where my highly connected assets are. So I can click on the uh, water treatment plants here and start to understand their connectivity. And we mentioned earlier about not building one digital twin to rule them all. And if we've got data that's well formatted in the outside world, we'll just go and grab it. So in this case, because we've unified the way that coordinates work in the system, so no matter where, where I get those coordinates from, I can very quickly go in and go in and open Street View to see that data. Really, really sort of simple thing to do. And it's this whole idea of not building one giant digital twin to rule them all. If there's good data elsewhere, why don't we just go and connect to it? Let's just give you a very, very quick demonstration of um, uh, another element of the system. So at the moment on the left-hand side here, you can see I can see a load of water assets. There's some medical facilities in there, which we've scraped from open source, or we did scrape from open source, but we haven't got any as vulnerable person information. Well, that's because I don't, I don't have the right attributes to see that. So if I very quickly come into this again, and I need to be an NHS worker, and I need to have some sort of security clearance. So I'm going to go in now as a, as a logistics operator in the NHS. And if I run up there again here now, go into Paralog, just quickly refresh it. We should see vulnerable people appear. Now, if I put the medical facilities on and the vulnerable people, I can start to see which of these vulnerable people depends on which medical facilities. Now, these are all fake people, as you'll see in a second from some of the names we've got in here. But as I'm a logistics driver, all I need to know is I need to pick up package from this medical facility and take it to this person here. Now, this person, I don't need to actually know their ID. I just need to know their address. That's because um, the attributes are not letting me see any personal information about the individual. They're just letting me see an address that I've got to take some stuff to. However, if I come back in and uh, change my clearance, let's say I've moved from being a logistics driver now and I'm a vulnerable care manager, I can update that my, my, my uh, security attributes, rerun that, bring in the vulnerable people in the medical again. And now when I click on one of the vulnerable people, we should see here, I can now see a name because I, as a vulnerable person, name, but I'm obviously going to need to know the name of the, of the, of, of, of the, of the patient I'm, I'm, I'm supposed to be helping. So it's a really, really simplistic example of a fine-grained security mechanism that's available to us using the, the core platform and the, inside the NDD integration architecture. Let's just very quickly move on to the next iteration of Paralog. Um, so this is a this is looking at flooding, and what we're doing here is we're bringing in data from the Environment Agency's APIs, so we can turn on some flood areas. So let me just let me just change the go to uh, basic, I think. Go to basic, and we can start turning on the flood areas again. All this geometry is being supplied by the um, the APIs run by the Environment Agency. But again, we can do some really simple stuff um, in here. So if I now turn on some electrical distribution data, and let's put some wastewater complexes on, we can start to see again the power of this data. So if I now come in here, and we can see that we've got a water treatment plant and uh, some uh, some other stuff right in the middle of a flood area. By clicking on that flood area again, by bringing all this data together. I can identify that I have 87 things that are potentially threatened by the um, ability, the, the, um, the flood at that waste trip, water treatment plant. Now, Paralog itself is not meant to be a, you know, it's, it's not meant to describe the art of spatial um, uh, uh, capability. That's what packages like Bentley, like ArcGIS, and all those are for. What it's meant to describe is we have been able to bring together all this data to cleanse it, to, uh, to resolve it, to unify it bring it into a single pa uh, um, a platform that you can build stuff across the top of. And the idea here is that imagine, you know, you, you connected to the NDT endpoint for an environment agency, you can go and grab that data. You can go and grab some data from a water company. You can go and grab some telecommunications data, knowing that all that formatting, that resolution has all been kind of taken care of for you. So really the thing to, to take from this demo is not necessarily parallel, which is a nice application. 
but it's, it's, it's meant to just show the power of bringing all that data together into an integration architecture and then and making it available, securely available for people to use. And I think, Ian, that's pretty much it, unless anybody's got any questions. Brilliant. 